Okay, good morning. Welcome to the class. So previously, we have talked about section 1.1, motion and motion graphs, and section 1.2, equations of motion. So today, let's have a look at the second lesson of chapter 1. So there are two topics in C1, L2, which are displacement in two dimensions and velocity and acceleration in two dimensions. So today we'll have a look at the first part of this lesson, which focuses on displacement in two dimensions. Okay, so far we have learned about motion in one dimension, right? This is adequate for learning basic principles of kinematics, but it's not enough to, to describe the motions of objects in real life. Cars and buses do not always move in a straight line because streets do not always follow straight lines, such as here, shown in figure one. Even train tracks change directions, and airplanes have both vertical and horizontal displacements. So in this section, we'll learn how to combine vectors to describe the position of object in two dimensions. From this, we will be able to determine the object two-dimensional displacement using different methods. This basic, but important skill will prepare us for describing two-dimensional velocities and accelerations using vector addition. Well, most of the concepts we have already learned in another class, which is called calculus and vectors, right? So let's have a look at how these concepts are applied in physics. Okay, so first let's have a look at displacement vectors and their properties. So in previous sections, we have review reviewed how some quantities such as speed are described solely in terms of magnitude, right? So these quantities are called scalars. And other quantities such as displacement and velocity are described in terms of both magnitude and direction. So these quantities are called vectors. So basically vectors have both magnitude and direction. As with equations in diagrams and figures, an arrow represents a vector quantity. The arrow's length indicates the magnitude of the vector. For example, how fast a car is moving and the direction of arrow indicates the direction of the vector relative to chosen coordinate system. For example, which way a car is moving. In most cases, we we'll use reference coordinates that are perpendicular to each other, such as X and Y, or North and East, and then describe the vector in two dimensions with respect to the coordinate system. So in previous two sections, or vector notation describes situations in one dimension. Now that we are describing situations in two dimensions, we need to slightly modify the notation here. For example, suppose we walk 15 meters toward the west, then your displacement will be 15 meters west. Now suppose you turn and walk 15 meters in the direction that is west, uh, north of west, 35 degrees. We express this dis displacement as 15 meters north of west, 35 degrees, as shown here in figure two. The direction north of west, 35 degrees, can be read as point west and then turn 35 toward north. Okay, so next let's have a look at some more fo <clears throat> formal way to describe vectors. So, we have already learned this concept in calculus and vectors class, right? So let's give it a brief review. Okay, first of all, a vector can be represented using several ways. First, we can describe vectors in words. 
for example. as five kilometers at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. And then we can describe vectors in the diagram as a geometric vector, which is a representation of a magnitude or size and direction. The length of the arrow represents and is proportional to the vector's magnitude. Third, we can also describe vectors in symbols using the endpoints of the arrow, such as A, B, with a arrow on top of it. Point A is a starting or initial point of vector, also known as tail. Then point B is the end or terminal point of the vector, also known as tip or head. And last, we can describe a vector using symbols. For example, we can use a letter V, with an arrow on top of it to describe a vector. Okay, so next let's have a look at the magnitude and direction of a geometric vector. The magnitude or size of a vector is designated using the absolute value of brackets. The magnitude of vector AB or vector V is written as, well, you can use the absolute value bracket of a, b, or v to denote the magnitude of this vector. Then a vector's direction can be expressed using several different methods. In the diagram of vector a, b, it is expressed as an angle moving counterclockwise with respect to a horizontal line, which is shown on the bottom left. For example, in this diagram, we can use the angle moving counterclockwise with respect to the horizontal line to describe the direction of vector A, B. And usually in navigation, vector directions are expressed as bearings. So there are two types of bearings, which is <clears throat> one of them is called true bearing or azimuth bearing. Another kind of bearing is called quadrant bearing. Let's have a look at the concept of these two types of bearings. First, a true bearing is a compass measurement where the angle is measured from north in a clockwise direction. True bearings are expressed as three digit numbers, including leading zeros. Thus, north is a bearing of zero, zero, zero degrees. East is zero, nine, zero degrees. South is 180 degrees, and west is 270 degrees. For example, a bearing of 040 degrees is an angle of 40 degrees in a counterclockwise direction from due north. For simplicity, we'll use the word bearing to refer to a true bearing. <clears throat> Another type of bearing is called quadrant bearing which is a measurement between zero and 90 degrees east of east or west of north-south line. The quadrant bearing N23 degrees west is shown in the diagram here, which is read as 23 degrees west of north. The quadrant bearing always has three components. The direction is measured from North in this case, the angle, which is uh, 23 degrees in this case, and the direction toward which it is measured. In this case, it's west. The quadrant bearing and 23 degrees west is read as 23 degrees west of north, where S 20 degrees east in 20 degrees of south. And also note that all quadrant bearings are referred from north or south, not from west or east. So <clears throat> back to this example. Although it is legit to use this 
symbol here. This means no uh, 35 degrees north of west. Also, it is legit. It is not recommended. When you describe a direction, usually we'll use two bearings or bearings, or you can also use quadrant bearings, okay? It is preferably to use quadrant, quadrant bearings or two bearings. And also remember you should be able to convert one type of direction to another, okay? For example, if you are given a true bearing, you should be able to convert a true bearing to a quadrant bearing or an angle moving counterclockwise with respect to a horizontal line. Okay, so next let's have a look at how we can determine the total displacement. So often we'll want to determine the total displacement a, of a object that has changed direction during its motion. In such cases, we'll treat the object linear displacement in each direction as a separate vector. Below us three different methods to determine the total displacement, delta D total. The scale diagram method, the cosine and sine laws method, and the perpendicular components of a vector method. Okay, so let's have a look at the three methods one by one. First, the scale diagram method. Representing vectors as arrows is a convenient way to add them together and determine the total displacement. Drawing a scale diagram is the most direct way of doing this. Simply draw the vectors, making sure that you draw the magnitudes to scale with respect to each other, and orient their directions correctly with respect to the coordinate system using a protractor. This approach to solve the problem lacks accuracy though. It makes it easier to visualize the vector addition. So here, figure three shows two displacements, delta D1 and delta D2, drawn to scale and added together. Each vector has magnitude and direction and both the lengths and the directions of the arrows are important. When you, draw each, when you draw each vector, you can choose where you want to locate the arrow, just as long as it has the same length and the same direction. If the arrow keeps its properties of magnitude and direction, it is still the same vector. You can draw, you can write this addition of vectors as delta D total, equals delta D1 plus delta D2. Also note that the three quantities here are all vectors. Also note that the addition of delta D1 and delta D2 and the total displacement delta D total form a triangle with delta D1 and delta D2 direct it one way around the triangle, or counterclockwise in this case, and delta D total directed the other way. The triangle concept can be difficult to understand, though. Thinking of uh, walking around the triangle on the ground, the two individual displacements, delta T1, delta D2, indicate one way you could walk around the triangle. The total displacement vector, delta D total, indicates the other way you could go. Also note that the order in which you add the vectors does not matter here, which means the addition is <clears throat> communicative. As long as you scale the arrows properly, orient them in the right directions, and then add the tail of one vector to the tip of the other. The total displacement will extend from the tail of the first displacement 
to the tip of the second displacement. This is true for all vectors, not just displacements. You must also remember to convert the answer you obtain from the scale diagram back into the actual answer using the scale. Okay, next let's have a look at the cosine and sine law method. Another method to determine the sum of two vectors is to use the cosine and sine laws. These trigonometric relations allow you to calculate the length of the total displacement vector and its angle of orientation with respect to the coordinate system. This trigonometric method only works when adding two vectors at a time, but the result is more accurate than that of a scale diagram. So next, we'll have a look at a sample problem in which we can determine the total displacement by drawing scale diagrams and then by using trigonometry. Okay, so let's consider this sample problem here. Vector addition by scale diagram. Suppose you walk to a friend's house. Taking a shortcut across an open field, your first displacement is 140. 35 degrees north of east across the field. Then you walk 200 meters east along a sidewalk. Can you determine your total displacement using a scale diagram? Okay, I'll, have, I'll give you uh, three minutes to have a look at this question by yourself. And then we'll have a look at the solution together. Remember, it asks you to find the answer using a scale diagram.
<clears throat> All right, have we finished? So well, let's have a look at the solution here. <clears throat> okay, so in this question, we are given delta D1 equals 140 meters. Direction is uh, 35 degrees north of east. And direction, a displacement. Second displacement, delta D2 equals 200 meters, and direction is east. We require the total displacement, delta DT, and the angle for delta DT. Let's denote it with a letter theta. Okay, so according to the addition of vectors, we know delta DT equals delta D1 plus delta D2. We can decide on a scale so that we can draw each vector to scale with the correct uh, direction with respect to the coordinate axis. Okay, so first step, we can choose a suitable scale. In this case, set the scale so that one centimeter denotes 40 meters. Then determine the length of the arrows for delta D1 and delta D2. Delta D1 is 3.5 centimeters and then delta D2 is five centimeters. Then step two, we can using uh we can use a ruler and uh, protractor, draw the two vectors, then place the tail of delta D two at the tip of delta D one as shown here in Figure four. Then <clears throat> draw the total displacement vector delta D T from the tail of delta D one to the tip of delta D two. Then measures the length of the vector and measures the angle the displacement vector makes to the horizontal, as shown here in Figure Five. The measured length of the total displacement vector is around eight point one centimeters. So we can convert to meters, which is uh, three to four meters. To two significant digits, the total displacement is then. Um, three to zero meters. The measured angle between east and total displacement vector is about 14 degrees. Okay, so in this solution, note that we have the final answer by using the measurements, using a ruler and a protractor, right? So as you can imagine here, this method will only give you a rough answer. It is not that accurate, right? <clears throat> so to find the accurate answers, we need to refer to some other method. So let's have a look at the second. Method, which is uh, using the cosine and sine laws. Okay. So again, for the same question, the given information is the same. Then in this solution, <clears throat> we have the second displacement is parallel to the east axis, right? And angle theta two, as shown here in this diagram, plus 35 degrees equals 180 degrees. So the angle theta two is 145 degrees, as shown here in figure six. Then cosine law tells us in this triangle here, we have the following relationship. A square plus B square, A square equals B square plus C square minus two BC cosine A, right? 
angle A is the angle between B and C. So put all the values in, we have the magnitude of delta D T square equals the magnitude of D1 square plus magnitude of D2 square minus two times the magnitude of delta D1 and the magnitude of delta D2 times cosine C to two which is uh, 140 meters square plus 200 meters square minus two times 140 meters times 200 meters times cosine 145 degrees. Then we can solve delta dt square is around 105473 square meters. Then the magnitude of delta dt is the positive square root of this number, which is around 324.8 meters. Then, <clears throat> according to the sine law, we have the following relationship. Sine c to 3 divided by delta d2 equals sine c to 2 over delta d total. Therefore, we know sine theta 3 equals delta d2 magnitude times sine theta 2 over the magnitude of delta dt, right? Now we have all the numbers here. Put all the numbers in. Sine theta 3 equals 200 times sine 145 over 324.8. And you can use arc sine to help you find theta 3. Also note that C3 should be an acute angle, right? So be careful when you want to solve a trigonometric equation. So C3 here is approximately 20.7 degrees, and the angle theta between east and total displacement is therefore 35 degrees minus 20.7 degrees, which is approximately 14.3 degrees. So the final statement is the displacement is delta dt equals 320 meters and the direction is 14 degrees north of east. Again, preferably <clears throat> you should express direction in a quadrant bearing or true bearing, okay? Although this way is legit, it is not recommended. So you could express delta t as 320 meters. Okay, so imagine 19 minus 14 is 76, right? So we could express that to 76 degrees east of north. <clears throat> okay, any questions? Okay, so now let's have a look at the third method for a similar problem, which is called the perpendicular components of a vector method. The most straightforward way of adding two or more displacement vectors is to resolve or separate each vector into perpendicular components. For two dimensions, the perpendicular components of a vector are uh, the parts of the vector that lie along either the x or y axis. This makes it easy to add components of several vectors that are all parallel. We obtain the components of total displacement vector by adding the parallel displacement components, which means you should express each of the component uh, of the vectors in Cartesian vectors. Okay, to do this. We need to be familiar with obtaining the components of a vector, which requires trigonometry. For example, suppose you walked a distance of five kilometers in a direction. That is <clears throat> east 37 degrees 
toward north. Oh, delta D equals five kilometers, 37 degrees north of east. As shown here in figure seven. In this example, we'll use the convention that east and north are positive. Draw the X component. We can position the tail of delta DX vector at the origin and make a vector going east. Then we draw this one first because it is indicated as the first direction in 37 degrees north of east from the tip of the X component. You draw the Y component, delta DY, directly north and stop at the tip of delta D. As shown here in figure seven, you draw the Y component second because it is the second direction listed in 37 degrees north of east. Then the components of this vector can be determined using the sine and cosine trigonometric ratios. So note that cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? And sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So in this example, we have cosine theta equals delta dx over the magnitude of delta d. Sine theta is delta dy over the magnitude of delta d, which means you can solve delta x is four kilometers direction is east. And delta dy is three kilometers and direction is north. So note that when drawing these displacement components, be sure to place the tail of the vertical displacement delta dy at the tip of the horizontal component delta dx. Keep in mind that theta will not always be the angle between the x-axis and the displacement. Sometimes theta will be situated between the x between the y-axis and the displacement. For this reason, always consider which component is opposite theta and which one is adjacent to theta to determine the component. To add and subtract vectors using components, you must first become adept at determining the components of vectors. Again, which means you should e express express each vector using their Cartesian notation. Okay, so now let's have a look at a sample problem to illustrate this process. Okay, so suppose we have a polar bear here, which walks towards Churchill, Manitoba. The polar bear's displacement is 15.0 kilometers. The so direction is six degrees east of south. Determine the components of this displacement. Okay, I'll give you two minutes to have a look at this question. Well, the method is actually similar to what we have used in the calculus and vectors class, right? <clears throat>
Okay, have we finished? Let's have a look at the solution here. So again, there are two notation systems you can use. Let's have a look at method one first. So for the first vector, we have delta. Uh, we can draw a diagram to illustrate this problem, right? Delta d1 can be resolved into delta d1x, which is uh, 250 kilometers times cosine 25 degrees which gives you 226.6 kilometers. And delta D1Y equals 250 kilometers times sine 25, which gives you positive 105.7 kilometers. Then for the second vector, we can do the same thing to resolve the second vector into X and Y directions, right? And delta D2X is negative 6299 kilometers. And delta D2Y equals negative 272.8 kilometers. So note here, delta D2X and delta D2Y are both negative. That means they are opposite to the direction you designated as positive, right? Then if you want to add the horizontal components, simply add delta D1X and delta D2X. This gives you the total displacement in X direction is one, 63.6 kilometers and direction is east. Then you can do the same thing to the vertical components, which gives you negative 167.1, which means <clears throat> uh, 167.1 kilometers direction is north, which also means positive 161 kilometers direction is south, right? So then you can combine the total displacement components to determine the total displacement. First of all, the magnitude of the total displacement, magnitude of delta D is the square root of delta DTX square plus delta DY square, which gives us approximately 233.9 kilometers. And theta is our tangent, the ratio between delta DY and delta DX magnitude. Then we can solve theta is approximately 46 degrees. So we can make the statement here. The airplane's total displacement is about two, three, four kilometers, and the direction is forty-six degrees south of east. Okay, so if you use another notation system, which we have already learned in calculus and vectors class, first we can use north. Okay, first just specify which direction you want to use as positive in X and Y axis, okay? So first state that you want to use North as positive X. X sorry, so this should be Y again, not X. <clears throat> first state that use North as a positive Y axis and East as positive X axis. This is by convention, right? Usually we'll use north as positive y and east as positive x to set up the 2D Cartesian system. Then we can let a angle alpha be the angle the first displacement vector d1 makes with the positive x axis. Let beta be the angle the second displacement vector d2 makes with the positive x axis. Then according to the given information, we can choose alpha equals 25 degrees and beta equals negative 103 degrees. Okay, you can decide the one possible values for alpha and beta according to the given information here. Also note that there are infinite number of possible values for alpha and beta, right? Because there are infinite numbers of co-terminal angles. As long as you can choose one possible values for alpha and beta, you'll be fine because we're going to use the definition of trigonometric ratios in 2D Cartesian space, 2D Cartesian systems to help us to find the two components. Okay, then the first displacement vector is D1 can be resolved to two components. First one is 250 times cosine alpha, which, which is cosine 25 degrees, right? And the Y component is 250 times sine alpha, which is sine 25 degrees. This is approximately 
226.6 and uh, 105.7 and unit is kilometers. Then following same method, second displacement factor is D2, which can be resolved to 280 times cosine beta, and then 280 times sine beta. This is according to the definition of sine and cosine in 2D Cartesian plane, right? Then the two components for D2 are negative 62.99 and negative 272.8. Again, the unit is kilometers. So the negative symbol here just denotes the direction of the two components are opposite to the designated positive directions along the two directions. Then the total displacement of the two components here is dt equals d1 plus d2, right? So note here, we have already... <clears throat> express d1 and d2 using Cartesian vectors. So simply put their Cartesian vectors to add them. Simply add the x components and then add the y components. So the total displacement dt equals 163.6 then negative 167.1. These are the two components for the total displacement. Okay, so if you know the two components of a total displacement, then you can calculate the magnitude of this vector, which is the square root of squared x component plus squared y component. And this gives us approximately 234 kilometers. Again, if you know the x and y components of a vector, you can also find the angle that this vector makes with positive x axis. So we can let theta denote the total displacement mix with the positive x axis. Then we have the following relationship. Tangent theta must equal the y component over the x component, which is around negative 1.021. Also note that the x component of dt is greater than zero and y component of dt is less than zero. This means the position vector of dt must lie in the third quadrant, right? So theta must equal arc tangent negative 1.021, which is around 45.60 degrees, which is uh, negative 45, 46 degrees. Oh, sorry, not the third quadrant, but the fourth quadrant, right? Because X component is greater than zero and Y component is less than zero. So we know that theta is in the fourth quadrant. So we can use arc tangent negative 1.021 as a result of theta. So a possible solution for theta is about negative 46 degrees, which means direction of dt is 44 degrees east of south. You can find the corresponding degree on a scratch paper, okay? Okay, so the final statement here can be written as the airplane's total displacement is approximately 234 kilometers and direction is 44 degrees east of south. <clears throat> Again, it is recommended to use the quadrant bearing or true bearings to denote the heading of airplane. Okay, any questions? Okay, if no questions, that's the end of today's lesson. So in our next lesson, we'll have a look at the second half of C2L, uh, C1L2. Okay, and uh, please remember to complete your homework in Google Classroom and submit them before the deadline. And I'll see you next time. Bye.